Chapter 14 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. But the reader, I expect, would have no objection to know a little about my employment during the two years while my competitor was in Congress. In this space I had some pretty tough times, and will relate some few things that happened to me. So here goes, as the boy said when he run by himself. In the fall of 1825, I concluded I would build two large boats and load them with pipe staves for market. So I went down to the lake, which was about 25 miles from where I lived, and hired some hands to assist me and went to work, some at boat building and others to getting staves. I worked on with my hands till the bears got fat, and then I turned out to hunting to lay in a supply of meat. I soon killed and salted down as many as were necessary for my family. But about this time, one of my old neighbors, who had settled down on the lake about 25 miles from me, came to my house and told me he wanted me to go down and kill some bears about in his parts. He said they were extremely fat and very plenty. I know that when they were fat, they were easily taken, for a fat bear can't run fast or long. But I asked the bear no favors, no way, further than civility, for I now had eight large dogs and as fierce as painters, so that a bear stood no chance at all to get away from them. So I went home with him and then went on down towards the Mississippi and commenced hunting. We were out two weeks and in that time killed fifteen bears. Having now supplied my friend with plenty of meat, I engaged occasionally again with my hands in our boat building and getting staves. But I at length couldn't stand it any longer without another hunt. So I concluded to take my little son and cross over the lake and take a hunt there. We got over and that evening turned out and killed three bears in little or no time. The next morning we drove up Four Forks and made a sort of scaffold on which we salted up our meat so as to have it out of the reach of the wolves, for as soon as we would leave our camp, they would take possession. We had just eat our breakfast when a company of hunters came to our camp, who had fourteen dogs, but all so poor, that when they would bark, they would almost have to lean up against a tree and take a rest. I told them their dogs couldn't run and smell of a bear, and they had better stay at my camp and feed them on the bones I had cut out of my meat. I left them there and cut out, but I hadn't gone far when my dogs took a first-rate start after a very large fat old he-bear, which run right plumb towards my camp. I pursued on, but my other hunters had heard my dogs coming and met them, and killed the bear before I got up with him. I gave him to them and cut out again for a creek called Big Clover, which wasn't very far off. Just as I got there, and was entering a cane break, my dogs all broke and went ahead, and in a little time they raised a fuss in the cane and seemed to be going every way. I listened a while and found my dogs was in two companies and that both was in a snorting fight. I sent my little son to one, and I broke for the t'other. I got to mine first and found my dogs had a two-year-old bear down, a woolen away on him, so I just took out my big butcher and went up and slapped it into him, and killed him without shooting. There was five of the dogs in my company. In a short time, I heard my little son fire at his bear. When I went to him, he had killed it too. He had two dogs in his team. Just at this moment, we heard my other dog barking a short distance off, and all the rest immediately broke to him. We pushed on too, and when we got there, we found he had still a larger bear than either of them we had killed treed by himself. We killed that one also, which made three we had killed in less than half an hour. We turned in and butchered them, and then started to hunt for water and a good place to camp. But we had no sooner started than our dogs took a start after another one, and away they went like a thunder gust and was out of hearing in a minute. We followed the way they had gone for some time, but at length we gave up the hope of finding them and turned back. As we were going back, I came to where a poor fellow was grubbing, and he looked like the very picture of hard times. 
I asked him what he was doing away there in the woods by himself. He said he was grubbing for a man who intended to settle there, and the reason why he did it was that he had no meat for his family and he was working for a little. I was mighty sorry for the poor fellow, for it was not only a hard but a very slow way to get meat for a hungry family. So I told him if he would go with me, I would give him more meat than he could get by grubbing in a month. I intended to supply him with meat, and also to get him to assist my little boy in packing in and salting up my bears. He had never seen a bear killed in his life. I told him I had six killed then, and my dogs were hard after another. He went off to his little cabin, which was a short distance in the brush, and his wife was very anxious he should go with me. So we started and went to where I had left my three bears and made a camp. We then gathered my meat and salted and scaffolded it as I had done the other. Night now came on, but no word from my dogs yet. I afterwards found they had treed the bear about five miles off, near to a man's house, and had barked at it the whole enduring night. Poor fellows! Many a time they looked for me and wondered why I didn't come, for they knowed there was no mistake in me, and I knowed they were as good as ever flooded. In the morning, as soon as it was light enough to see, the man took his gun and went to them and shot the bear and killed it. My dogs, however, wouldn't have anything to say to this stranger, so they left him and came early in the morning back to me. We got our breakfast and cut out again, and we killed four large and very fat bears that day. We hunted out the week, and in that time we killed seventeen, all of them first rate. When we closed our hunt, I gave the man over a thousand weight of fine fat bear meat, which pleased him mightily and made him feel as rich as a Jew. I saw him the next fall, and he told me he had plenty of meat to do him the whole year from his week's hunt. My son and me now went home. This was the week between Christmas and New Year that we made this hunt. When I got home, one of my neighbors was out of meat and wanted me to go back and let him go with me to take another hunt. I couldn't refuse, but I told him I was afraid the bear had taken a house by that time, for after they get very fat in the fall and early part of the winter, they go into their holes in large hollow trees or in the hollow logs or in their cane houses or the hurricanes and lie there till spring like frozen snakes. And one thing about this will seem mighty strange to many people. From about the 1st of January to about the last of April, these varmints lie in their holes altogether. In all that time, they have no food to eat, and yet, when they come out, they are not an ounce lighter than when they went to house. I don't know the cause of this, and still I know it is a fact, and I leave it for others who have more learning than myself to account for it. They have not a particle of food with them, but they just lie and suck the bottom of their paw all the time. I have killed many of them in their trees, which enables me to speak positively on this subject. However, my neighbor, whose name was McDaniel, and my little son and me, went on down to the lake to my second camp, where I had killed my seventeen bears the week before and turned out to hunt but we hunted hard all day without getting a single start. We had carried but little provisions with us, and the next morning was entirely out of meat. I sent my son about three miles off to the house of an old friend to get some. The old gentleman was much pleased to hear I was hunting in those parts, for the year before the bears had killed a great many of his hogs. He was that day killing his bacon hogs, and so he gave my son some meat and sent word to me that I must come into his house that evening, that he would have plenty of feed for my dogs and some accommodations for ourselves. But before my son got back, we had gone out hunting, and in a large cane break my dogs found a big bear in a cane house, which he had fixed for his winter quarters, as they sometimes do. When my lead dog found him and raised the yell, all the rest broke to him, but none of them entered his house until we got up. I encouraged my dogs, and they knowed me so well that I could have made them seize the old serpent himself 
with all his horns and heads and cloven foot and ugliness into the bargain, if he would only have come to light so that they could have seen him. They bulged in, and in an instant the bear followed them out, and I told my friend to shoot him, as he was mighty wrathy to kill a bear. He did so, and killed him prime. We carried him to our camp, by which time my son had returned, and after we got our dinners we packed up and cut for the house of my old friend, whose name was Davidson. We got there and stayed with him that night, and the next morning, having salted up our meat, we left it with him and started to take a hunt between the Obion Lake and the Redfoot Lake, as there had been a dreadful hurricane which passed between them, and I was sure there must be a heap of bears in the fallen timber. We had gone about five miles without seeing any sign at all, but at length we got on some high caney ridges, and, as we rode along, I saw a hole in a large black oak, and on examining more closely, I discovered that a bear had clomb the tree. I could see his tracks going up, but none coming down, and so I was sure he was in there. A person who is acquainted with bear hunting can tell easy enough when the vomit is in the hollow, for as they go up they don't slip a bit, but as they come down they make long scratches with their nails. My friend was a little ahead of me, but I called him back and told him there was a bear in that tree and I must have him out. So we lit from our horses, and I found a small tree which I thought I could fall so as to lodge against my bear tree, and we fell to work chopping it with our tomahawks. I intended, when we lodged the tree against the other, to let my little son go up and look into the hole, for he could climb like a squirrel. We had chopped on a little time and stopped to rest, when I heard my dogs barking mighty severe at some distance from us, and I told my friend I knowed they had a bear, for it is the nature of a dog when he finds you are hunting bears, to hunt for nothing else. He becomes fond of the meat, and considers other game as not worth a notice, as old Johnson said of the devil. We concluded to leave our tree a bit, and went to my dogs, and when we got there, sure enough, they had an eternal great big fat bear up a tree, just ready for shooting. My friend again petitioned me for liberty to shoot this one also. I had a little rather not, as the bear was so big, but I couldn't refuse, and so he blazed away, and down came the old fellow like some great log and fell. I now missed one of my dogs, the same that I before spoke of as having treed the bear by himself some time before when I had started the three in the cane break. I told my friend that my missing dog had a bear somewhere, just as sure as fate, so I left them to butcher the one we had just killed and I went up on a piece of high ground to listen for my dog. I heard him barking with all his might some distance off, and I pushed ahead for him. My other dogs, hearing him, broke to him, and when I got there, sure enough again, he had another bear ready treed. If he hadn't, I wish I may be shot. I fired on him and brought him down, and then went back and helped finish butchering the one at which I had left my friend. We then packed both to our tree where we had left my boy. By this time, the little fellow had cut the tree down that we intended to lodge, but it fell the wrong way. He had then feathered in on the big tree to cut that, and had found that it was nothing but a shell on the outside and all doted in the middle, as too many of our big men are these days, having only an outside appearance. My friend and my son cut away on it and I went off about a hundred yards with my dogs to keep them from running under the tree when it should fall. On looking back at the hole, I saw the bear's head out of it, looking down at them as they were cutting. I hollered to them to look up, and they did so, and McDaniel catched up his gun, but by this time the bear was out and coming down the tree. He fired at it, and as soon as it touched ground, the dogs were all around it, and they had a rolling tumble fight to the foot of the hill where they stopped him. I ran up, and putting my gun against the bear, fired and killed him. We now had three, and so we made our scaffold and salted them up. End of chapter 14 Recording by Todd Majors